Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just wait for everyone to register, or at least a few more people to register. Let's give it another two minutes. There's 24 people logged on so far. So let's give a few more minutes because we know there were quite a few more registered. Okay, I think we should kick off now. Um, Okie dokie, so really nice to be chairing this webinar this afternoon. It's going to be a really informal session with plenty of opportunity for discussion. Um, our panel are all excited to meet you and to talk with you and to share their experiences. Um, we'll have a couple of slides just to take you through what the leadership program um, that the society ran looked like and our plans for 2023. And also I'll explain a little bit how the programme came into being. Um, Julie will take you then through some reflections about ICU leadership. And then of course, we'll go on to our discussion with some great alumni from our first leadership programme, LEAP One. So introductions first, my name's Sandy Mather and I'm Chief Exec of the Intensive Care Society and one of the course directors for our leadership programme. Julie, do you want to go next? Thank you, Sandy. So I'm Julie Highfield. I'm the Wellbeing Director for the Intensive Care Society and one, another one of the course directors for the LEAP programme. And I work as a psychologist in intensive care. Super. Thanks, Julie. Alison. Hi, I'm Alison Quinn. I'm the Clinical Director for Intensive Care at the Royal Albert Edward Infirmary in Wigan. Thank you, Alison. David. Hi, I'm David Zapsford. I'm Consultant Pharmacist in Critical Care at Cambridge University Hospitals. Uh, I'm also Deputy Chair of the Pharmacy PAG at the ICS. Super, thank you. Emma. Hi, I'm Emma Bryden. I'm a consultant uh, intensivist and anaesthetist at Wexham Park Hospital. It's part of Frimley Health in uh, just outside of London, Islam. Thank you. Laura? Hi, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm a consultant intensivist and anaesthetist at Warrington Hospital and clinical lead um, in intensive care and have just become um, director of medical care as well. Congratulations. Matt? Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Jackson. I'm another consultant in ICU and anaesthesia, uh, and I'm clinical director at Stepping Hill Hospital in Stockport. Thank you. And Sam? Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Dean. I'm a clinical specialist physiotherapist working at uh, Sheffield Teaching Hospital's General Critical Care. 
Brilliant. So that's our amazing panel. Um, I'm going to take you through how we decided to create this um, programme and why we decided to tailor it specifically for intensive care. Back in 2021, Stephen Webb, president, just newly elected president, and I um, talked a lot about leadership and being able to develop a modular leadership programme for intensive care staff. And at the same time, Julie, in her role as wellbeing director, was thinking along the same lines. So the three of us got together and we looked at various models and we considered outsourcing the leadership course, maybe um, uh, endorsing another provider, um, maybe paying for it completely. And we met with various providers and they were all in incredibly expensive. And also, more importantly, none of them looked at the lived experience of leaders within intensive care and the unique experiences you all have. And we knew that for knowledge exchange to be really effective, that's what we wanted. We wanted people that understood about intensive care. So we decided to look at other options and we met with someone called Chris Wilkinson, who was uh, an ICU nurse. Um, from many years ago and who was still involved in leadership development in the NHS. And together, the four of us co-created a tailored leadership program for intensive care professionals. We also worked with our um, equality, diversity and inclusion group. And I remember giving a presentation to them at one of their first face-to-face -face meetings and asking them for their advice about how we could reach difficult to access groups so we could have as diverse a cohort for our first cohort as possible. We also designed the programme to be both um, virtual via Zoom and also in person, again, to increase accessibility for those that may find it difficult to travel. We wanted to ensure there was a really good balance between tacit and explicit knowledge exchange, that um, explicit knowledge being what, what you can codify and put in a curriculum and give us very much as a lecture, but also we wanted to use the business school methodology of having an expert there who could interact, but also be interrupted during their presentation and have a dialogue with senior people. And we wanted some tacit knowledge exchange opportunities. So opportunities for people to informally share learning, to practice what they were doing and then to come back to the leadership program, share how they'd implemented it in practice and what they learned. Some of the speakers we had also came from NHS England, as well as um, directors in NHS trusts, and of course, clinical psychologists and organizational psychologists, including, of course, our amazing Julie Highfield. The modules included both group work and lectures, and there was plenty of interaction and opportunity for questions. The course in 2022 ran from April to November, and we're planning for the next course to likewise run for the same time period. Um, we had 14 half-day, sorry, a number of half-day modules that will be 14 half-day modules next year. And um, we had 18 LEAP1 delegates. And you can see the spread of professions we had there. Myself and Stephen Webb as president and CEO uh, did the shortlisting for the applicants on the first uh, cohort. And we really wanted to get as wide a spread as possible. We were hoping for UK wide representation. Um, we were able to get England and Wales, but um, no delegates from Scotland or Northern Ireland. Um, we also wanted all of the professions that we represent at the Intensive Care Society to be represented. And, and we wanted as well a good gender balance and a reflection of the numbers of staff in, in the Intensive Care Unit to be reflected in the proportions of staff within the uh, module for LEAP 1. So moving on to LEAP 2, um, what are we going to offer? Well, LEAP 2 has been modified just a small amount with the learning from our colleagues from LEAP 1. We're going to still keep a lot of the business school speakers that we had on there and the NHS directors, et cetera. But we're going to have one of the first sessions is going to be in person, whereas previously for LEAP 1, we had it virtually. And particularly Julie and I as the course directors, we found it was quite difficult for us to interact with you. And then when we met you in person in SOA, um, all of the LEAP 1 delegates said, actually, we'd have 
like to have met a little bit sooner to build up those relationships for tacit knowledge exchange. So that's why the first module will be in person. You can see that we're going to have conversations about leading successful and sustainable projects for quality improvement. That was one of the, the areas that we asked people to write about in the application. So what ideas do you have for a project for quality improvement? And it brings a learning back into your unit. Um, obviously, NHS infrastructure and values. We had um, some really good sessions from the business school about business cases and also from a director of finance explaining how it would work, uh, how it, you can work most effectively with your finance team. And we looked at the future of critical care with the National Clinical Director for Critical Care from NHS England. And then development of self as leader, leading with emotional intelligence and managing difficult conversations. And our final session was about systems leadership. So that's what we'll be doing for LEAP 2. So what does LEAP 2 entail? For LEAP 1, we, um, we were very fortunate to be able to secure charitable funding from the COVID Healthcare Support Appeal. And it was also co-funded with the Intensive Care Society. Um, we've been applying for grants left, right and centre for LEAP 2. Sorry, that was for LEAP 1. For LEAP 2, we haven't been successful at securing grant funding. I've also applied to NHS England for some grant funding to be able to cover the costs, but at the moment we have to transfer the costs onto delegates. Um, we've looked at comparator courses and, and this is pretty comparable, comparable with others within the NHS and so it will be £2,995 uh, and um, for that there'll be four days access to state-of-the-art congress and the pre-congress workshop as well six sessions of leadership coaching with psychologists who are experienced in working with people from intensive care, really important. Obviously the networking, then um, the, the 360 degree leadership assessment as well. And we have an online portal for all leadership modules, which is just focused entirely on each cohort. So LEAP1 has its own module access and LEAP2 will as well. So who can apply? Well, anyone with a leadership role in intensive care, and we've got 25 places available in 2023. We had 18 for 2022, as it was our first cohort. Actually, we were funded for 15, but we had such an interest that we expanded it to 18, um, which was the increased funding that the Intensive Care Society provided as well. We have a dedicated website on our web pages, www.ics.ac.uk forward slash leadership. Closing date is Sunday the 12th of February and um, myself and the new president Steve Mattia will be shortlisting and all applicants will be informed by the 10th of March 2023 and that will be for an April start. So applications are now open and if you have any questions please do contact us or you can contact the generic email at communications at ics.ac.uk. Julie over to you. Fabulous. Thank you, Sandy. And it's so lovely to hear you describe all the work and thinking that went into that and just taking us back uh, to the start of that journey and just remembering all those conversations with yourself and Stephen. So um, I guess a little step back and kind of thinking about leadership in intensive care. Um, and I, you know, in my lovely role that I have with the Intensive Care Society, but also within um, my own intensive care, I've learned a lot about leadership along the way. And that was just one of those sort of passionate drivers for this course. And I, I think just a few things that make it quite um, quite a challenge um, and, and quite a difficult thing to do uh, leading with intensive care. Just to kind of state the obvious to our audience who are probably all from intensive care environments, but just reminding yourself that actually when you lead in a 24-7 environment, never the twain shall meet. You know, that classic phrase that we say to each other, I haven't seen you for ages. It's so hard to kind of find that level of visibility, isn't it? And when, when you're kind of designated as a lead, gathering people together can be such a challenge. 
most of our leaders continue on clinical duties. Some of those include night duties and weekend duties as well alongside their leadership role. So I like to think of that as uh, fueling the plane while it's still in flight really so it can really affect your your kind of organizational skills your your ability to kind of focus on on kind of making changes and of course you know we love our multi-professional environment of intensive care it's one of the things that i really learned and appreciated listening to to the leap colleagues from across other icus is just how much we do that incredibly well in intensive care but we could do it so much better still i think but it's trying to engage people from all those um levels and then you know uh, ian ian would say this our systems leadership man and it's it's something that stayed in my mind all all the time is just because you have a leadership position doesn't always mean you're authorized for action and that's not unique to intensive care but when we often think what is the work and whose work is it often the work is those above us and actually trying to engage with them and feeling like I can see the change that needs to happen in my intensive care, but I need buy-in from above and where is my authority? And, and of course, you know, it goes without saying, especially in the last few years, um, intensive care is an intensive system. Uh, there's a lot of people, it's uh, a system that's absolutely under pressure and um, we reflected as a group and learned quite a lot about how people act under that pressure and, and knowing people and working with people where they're at is a key leadership challenge and of course the, the thing that the intensive care society likes to uh, do and, and drives forward but is is thinking about being the voice of intensive care within the wider system so you know we we try to do that as the society uh, but also working together with you within your own organizations and systems so it's a challenging place um and we were so keen to to bring people together to share that peer support and that li lived experience and here's just a, a couple of um the quotes uh from our team so i'll just read these through so this has not only helped shape my role as a leader but it's given me a significant amount of skills that i hope to keep improving on throughout my leadership journey i've enjoyed what i've learned and this support has been paramount in my learning this course has allowed me to understand leadership across many domains and across professions I've reflected on how this is applicable to my practice and my future. Lack of confidence and imposter syndrome, something we all hold, is part of who I am. But this course has really helped with both these and additional knowledge. Um, and with additional knowledge, my self-confidence has massively increased. And this has helped me so much as a leader. And then of course, thinking about the, the wider program and all of our external speakers that contributed, the caliber of the whole course was very high and I couldn't believe I was taking part in it. And that's absolutely wonderful quotes from our team of Leap One, Leapers. Uh, so now we're just going to stop talking about it ourselves and listen to their experience. So we have uh, our lovely panel today are all Leap One delegates um, and we didn't have to bribe them in any way and we haven't pre-trained them with what they might say just to say. Uh, but we have a couple of questions that we want to discuss with them so I'm going to stop sharing so that we can discuss as a group. But also for those of you in the background listening, if you have particular questions you want to put to our panel or myself and Sandy, please could you use the Q&A function and we'll monitor that as we go and get a bit of an interactive dialogue going. So, so fab, brilliant. So, leapers, <laughs> time, time for a bit of reflection. So um, I'm going to open with you, Matt if it's okay. Um, so you heard me describe some of my thoughts on, on what are the leadership challenges in intensive care. What, what do you think? What strikes you as the challenges 
Yeah, I was just looking at your slide there, Julian. I thought uh, it, it's it, it's going to look like you have primed me because I think my challenges sort of uh, come out sounding very similar. Um, I think the the three general three areas that I kind of feel the challenges are. Uh, sort of one of them are personal personal challenges. Uh, the second is sort of more generic leadership challenges that you know sort of anyone in a leadership role in any sector are, are going to feel. Uh, and then there are those sort of specific ICU challenges. Um, and I you know I think one of the things talking to everyone on the course is we all had some degree of imposter syndrome. We were all uh, in some form of leadership position. Uh, and felt very comfortable and confident doing the clinical side of the job, uh, but felt like no one had ever trained us to do any leadership stuff. You know, we'd we'd done various bits and pieces along the, the way and sort of made changes, you know, helped bring changes about in the clinical environment. But no one had ever sat down with us and said, this is how you lead someone. This is, you know, this is how it all works. Uh, and I, I guess, um, you know, that that's one of the challenges and one of the main drivers uh, I think for myself and for many people uh, on, on the course for, for, for joining up. I'm not going to spend too long, too long uh, talking about the general challenges of leadership because they, they are very generic. But, uh, you know, sort of some of the specific ICU challenges, uh, I can't help but feel that every problem with inpatient hospital care ultimately will filter down to ICU at some point and become uh, part of ICU's problem. Uh, you know, so as as part of the ICU team, you, you, you're not only carrying the burden of your unit, but sometimes the burden of, of uh, all inpatient hospital care. Uh, and I think that that is relatively, relatively unique. Um, ICUs, you know, an ICU is a mini hospital. You know, you've, you've got some biochemistry tests going on on the unit. You've got to have your own feeding policies. You've, you've got to have, you know, sort of your own technical department. You've got to, you know, you've got lots of different groups of people to look after. You know, there's you've got to have your own ng tube policy your own insulin policy you know it's a lot of the generic stuff that goes in the hospital on in the hospital goes on in a slightly more specialized way on icu and and you know there's there's a massive burden there in, in leadership and sort of making sure that all those things work properly on icu because they're just a little bit different and the generic hospital way of doing things doesn't quite uh doesn't doesn't quite work um and then you know a I guess as clinical director, I'm constantly thinking about my my own unit a lot of the time, but actually we work as a network as well. And I think, you know, sort of uh, certainly over the last few years, we've really seen the strength of uh, network working as well. And, you know, the my beds, you know, the beds that I look after are actually part of a wider set of beds across Greater Manchester. And, you know, that's that's true for all of us, which whichever location we're in. Um, and, you know, I guess sort of the follow on thoughts for this is, you know, when I was looking to develop my own leadership, my question to myself was, do I do sort of a generic course and deal with sort of some of the generic problems and my personal demons, or do I do something that's sort of more ICU specific and gonna, gonna help me do, um, you know, think about some of these ICU specific problems. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I obviously chose the ICU one. <laughs> you did the right choice. <laughs> I really love that line. I'm definitely going to borrow that. Um, ICU is a mini hospital. And I, I think that's such an important line. I saw everyone sort of nodding and smiling there. And I think often one of those challenges is the hospital doesn't understand why we don't follow everything that the hospital has set in that way and why we like to do our own thing. And that's that's just a really brilliant way of crystallizing that. Does anyone want to add anything to what Matt said? I, I, can, I can I can just add briefly just about um as a, an AHP within ICU so just a little bit like the challenges that might bring on top of that so um, working along uh, all the other leap one um people then you get to recognize all these other amazing leaders in ICU so then the challenges that being a smaller like cohort of AHPs um, within that then actually um that brings other challenges such as we've got bigger like, clinical priorities and how we balance all in priorities and actually then um, trying to figure out um, how we fit in with the rest of the ICU team as well. So, um, and I know that's a lot of big national work is helping that as well. So I just thought I'd add, add that in around actually, it um, adds a different dimension as well. Yeah, that's really, really useful. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And actually, if we, we kind of segue on, Sam, it was you I was going to ask about actually what inspired you to join the Society's programme. Yeah, so uh, Matt touched on a couple of the points um, uh, as well. So it was kind of mentioning that we don't really get the, the leadership training. So you just kind of, you, you apply for your post and you get your post and you all know you're going into a leadership role. Um, and then you get in that role and you're just a bit like, oh, that, that's it now. I'm expected to, to know what I'm doing, carry on lead a team and uh, a whole team of um, ICD, which is um, can be quite a scary prospect. Um, so I just wanted something, something to, somewhere to start, a base, a foundation. Um, and uh, as Matt said, we get lots of opportunities within our, within, especially within my trust of people, these generic leadership courses where um, uh, aspiring leaders and uh, building our leadership skills and, and that's something that I, I seriously considered and then this came up and I, I just thought a lot of stuff that Sandu was saying and what you were saying Matt around actually it's it's specific to the ICU it gives me it helps me develop how these aforementioned challenges that you just mentioned how, how we can maybe overcome them how can how I can uh, help develop problems uh, help develop and understand these problems and and, and get other people's um, understanding on that as well across multi professionals. So that's something that really helped me um, within my leadership journey, not just being a generic leadership program, but actually something really specific to the ITU that I can network with everyone um, that's been on this program and actually understanding that it was really relevant. And it's not just me that's just got the same problems. Um, it's not just the physios in that it's not just the pharmacists the, the medics the dietitians the speech and language therapists we, we've all got the same problems and and we've all got the same issues within within ICU so it's really great to realize that you're not alone and um, all the problems are, are, are same nationwide and across so having the network and uh, the the discussions between people virtually face to face was was, was brilliant so that's really why I wanted to join the program and actually the leap one was just a perfect came across at the perfect time and it was it seemed like a perfect fit um so that's why I kind of wanted to join something that's lovely thank you Sam and I, I think we've we've learned so much from you guys as well and I think it was so lovely for me to hear everyone everyone's in it together I think it's that networking is is Brilliant, isn't it? Um, anyone else want to add anything to Sam's points? No? Fab. So um, it's been a pressured time, to say the least, and things like education and personal development have taken a bit of a backseat for many people. So getting your team and getting your managers uh, support for this is, is kind of challenging. So, so Emma, if I could come to you, um, how did you gain your manager's support? What was that like? I, I agree with everything you said there. It's so coming out of the pandemic, I think we all recognised and talking to, again, the group, and this is where it's been so supportive and helpful, is we're all facing massive squeeze um, on, on those extra things that actually are going to add value to your department and, and develop you as in, you know, in your career. Um, I started my consultant uh, post in September 2020, so mid-pandemic, and um, thrust into a very busy uh, DGH with huge demand within our region for um, ITU services and often overwhelmed. And it just felt like that actually my management understanding leadership journey was sort of stalled at the first hurdle because you were just so focused on all the clinical stuff. So coming out of that, I really felt that um, the new challenges we're all gonna face in the healthcare system are, are constantly gonna be putting us under pressure. And my sort of vision was, well, I've got to try and get on board with this, understand it more, get some more knowledge, feel more confident, and then I can I can step forward and offer some help and support and take on roles that I feel like I'll, I'll be ready for. Um, and I think when you go and speak to most of your um, leadership um, people in your department, you know, over a cup of tea, you sort of find out that none of them had any training for what they're doing either. A lot of them are all you know, trying to get tips and tips from the last person who did the role and, and, and getting understanding from them. And actually what they would really like is they would like people to come with some of these leadership skills that they've developed off their own back or whatever, 
and um and and that can hopefully allow some future planning for the department they can identify people who will be able to migrate into roles when they're ready to do so and um and when i sort of placed it in that sort of forum over a cup of tea a couple of times and i was told you know actually yeah this is the kind of thing that we that we will be able to um support fortunately for me i was able to do some of it on my off days um got enough study leave approved to be able to do it for the going to the congress and um the face to face days we had to do um which was really supportive of the department um and i think you know once they saw the quality of what was going to be delivered they were really pleased that it was something i could hopefully bring back within our small department and and then take things forward um so I, I think it's it's about having conversations with people, go to them, see what their priorities are, try and help them and, you know, see how this is going to benefit them as well as you. And um, and hopefully over that cup of tea or or whatever it is you choose to, to chat to them about, you can really show that this is a really highly valuable course. Um, as Matt said and Sam said, you know, pressure on intensive care is not going to reduce anytime soon. We're not going to be going back to the good old days where you have an empty bed every other day. Um, we're going to be constantly asked to evolve and to change, and that's going to take dynamic and um, you know inspirational leadership at times. And I think this course gave all the right tick boxes for having a foundation and being able to build on that. And I think if you take it to the management like that and explain to them, um, you know, it would be a sad day when departments don't look at it as a positive rather than a negative. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Emma. Anyone want to add? to Emma's comments there. What I particularly liked about what you said there, Emma, was there's something about you bringing it to the managers as a potential for solution. You know, here, here's something, enable me to do this and I can, I can do good for you. And I, I think that's something we, we've reflected on in terms of um, everyone's got their emotional load as managers and you know the more people you look after the harder it is to think some of these things through so part of that on the start of your leadership journey is about understanding that and kind of helping your managers to help you as well so yeah yeah Lovely. julie can i can i just um add something um it was really interesting hearing you you explain how you talked it through with your manager uh, emma and, and colleagues as well of course because they're impacted um, when we created the information pack in advance of the society, we put a template letter on the website that you could be downloaded. We gave information. Is, is there anything else that we could provide to future delegates to help them per, to be able to persuade their managers that we've got a flyer available, et cetera, et cetera. But any other tips and things that you could suggest that we could add? I, I don't I don't know if there's anything specific written that would make a difference. I think it's it's a it's like anything, you know, you need to identify the need. And if, if your department, like most departments, I think, around the country, have a need for um, as I said, an evolution of the man of the leadership plan, you know, somebody can't stay clinical director forever, it's going to go around to the next person. And in order to, you know, push the department forward, I think that's where most people I think would see you being able to, to do this. Certainly having a detail of who the speakers are and what kind of caliber they're gonna be, having a bit of information about um, what the ICS Congress is. Most of the time you're selling it to people within your specialty. So you don't have to persuade them too much because they understand where you're gonna go. I think um, obviously we had the massive benefit that this was funded. If you're gonna go and ask for funding, it may be useful to have um, a bit more information about what the SOA brings, um and, and what that kind of networking situation is and those bits because then other people outside your department who you may have to go and persuade for a bit of funding for this um they may actually benefit from some of that as well really helpful thanks emma we'll look at that yeah yeah matt do you want to come in with your comments yeah i think just echoing uh what emma said i think uh you know I found it very much pushing on an open door because it was because it was predominantly funded. Uh, so it was, you know, ultimately using my days off uh, and uh, getting a little bit of money for 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 for, uh, for transport. I think for the next round of candidates, uh, you know, actually, if you look at what's in the course package, it's there's a there's a lot of value in there. The the mentorship sessions, the three sixty degree thing, uh, going to state of the art. It is actually, if you were to buy them by themselves, quite quite a 
quite a fair amount of money. And I think if there was just a way that the ICS could almost say, you know, the, this is this is you know this is a bundle deal and and it's actually representing a saving that that would really help. Uh, one of the problems I would envisage having at my own trust was I to look to get onto Leap Two is um, we've we've got our own locally run management course now, uh, which if we're honest is you know someone from endocrinology talking about something, someone from respiratory medicine talking about something, someone from uh, Obs and Gyne talking about something. And I, I think, you know, so just really highlighting that we've got the national, you know, real national leaders speaking um, on this course uh, would really sort of help demonstrate that that is a massive value that that isn't going to be on sort of a locally run course. Oops, I couldn't unmute. That's really helpful. Thank you, Matt. And then David. Thanks, Julie. Um, I was just going to say that it... It's not. It's not really a, a a solution or a suggestion, but perhaps a slight challenge is for for departments that have multiple specialities within them that aren't directly um, sort of employed by quick care. I think that that's a perhaps a little bit of a challenge um, because, of course, you, you're sort of almost like putting your eggs in one basket, perhaps. Um, so, so that's that's possibly a challenge, and and how we provide any resource to to try and support that challenges is possibly quite difficult to do but i um, happy to to sort of give it some thought and uh, see if I can help with that. Yes thank you David and I, I think we, we're also looking for and as we find more and more stuff we'll be adding it to the website so for instance we, we had a low number of applications from nurses and we really really want to encourage nurses to apply as well but there are some grants available from BACCN for instance um, so putting that kind of information on the website to help people with their thinking and planning is key so so yeah and any ideas welcome and of course any ideas from people in the chat and the q a as well that would be really welcome too so thank you so so the next question is a bit of a whopper really so it's, it's a hard one to summarize but um uh, alison you've opted to answer this what are the key things you think you have learned through this program Okay, so for me, I came into my leadership role mid-pandemic, so I was thrown into it and quite honestly, for, for quite some time, felt I was winging it. Um, my leadership approach at this time was very reactive um, and quite honestly, I felt a lot of things were just a continual fight. So I was very much in fight or flight mode for the entire time. Um, obviously, coming out of the pandemic, I, I couldn't really sustain that. And um, so I had to reevaluate my foundations as a leader. And I think this course really helped me to take things back to basics and also to get, give me the confidence that I wasn't really winging it, that, that I did have a bit of knowledge behind me. Um, and there were some sound building blocks that I was bringing to it. Um, so it's enabled me to become much more proactive in my approach, much more forward thinking. Um, Personally, I found the one-to-one -one coaching sessions really invaluable um, because that meant that I could I could take my challenges and I could unpick them with somebody um, and I could reframe it. Um, so, I, you know, we could talk through what approaches I might take, what the outcome might be. Um, and that, that's helped me have much more success in dealing with certain things. And also, um, we've done quite a bit around psychology on the course. Um, you know, so things that I would have found challenging previously, thinking about, well, well, why is this happening? You know, why are people behaving like this? Um, you know, and, and what can I, what can I change about this and, and how I view it to make make things more simple to solve, really, from a leadership point of view? Um, as both Matt and Sam have mentioned, so suddenly having this network of people that you can share ideas with, share problems with. Um, and that realization, because ICU leadership can be a really lonely place. Um, we, we don't fit quite as well with the other departments in the hospital in the situations that we face. So having people that you can take things back to and say, you know, you, has anybody have ever had this problem? What did you do about it? What would you recommend? Um, and also like coming from a DGH background, you know, working with all, all these fantastic AHPs that we just don't have on our unit, 
you know, so being able to go and ask people, um, you know, for, for example, my speech and language colleagues that I've met on the course, you know, wh what can I do about this? You know, how do I, how do I implement that here? And as part of that, we all did our QI project um, on the course. So actually, I've come away with 17 great ideas that are just ripe for implementing in my own unit. And um, so rather than going away and reinventing a wheel, um, basically, I can pilfer ideas from other people. Um, but from my own point of view, it's given myself the chance to re reflect on me as a leader. Um, and I think to probably become more, more compassionate and reflective in my leadership approach. Um, and I think that's beneficial um, to, to my team. Um, also from an ambition point of view, I, I've never had the opportunity to ask questions of national leaders. Um, so that was really quite an eye opener um, to be able to do that, you know, and to realize that these people are also just human too, you know, and they started, you know, in similar backgrounds to the rest of us. Um, you know, so also to give that ambition and drive in, in what we're doing, you know, and how how we can aim to improve um, throughout our careers. So yeah, that's about it. I mean, that's an awful lot, isn't it? That's fantastic <laughs> to hear, Alison. Thank you so much, and lots lots of people nodding along with that. It it, it just um, it's amazing when we look back and just the richness of that and the different ways of learning as well does anyone want to add any further comments or further reflections of the things that stick in their mind that they learn sam go for it i was just going to say the, the the speakers and other people's leadership journeys not the speakers but just other people's on the course as well really inspirational and motivational to see to say this is this is where I'm at, and this is what I want to do next. And just to go, just because you feel like you are not the leader, actually, to be able to go and do other stuff and be able to be inspired and motivated to go do the, these things was, was was really helpful for me, and that's what I took um, uh, apart from it as well. That's lovely. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. So. Uh, our last question. So if you're sat in the audience and you're you're brewing a question, time to stick it in the, the Q&A. Uh, but the last question to go to David, uh, we've heard lots and lots of encouraging things. But what would you say, David, to encourage others to consider this course? Um, thanks. Um, and firstly, I just want to say it's it's just delightful to see um, friends and colleagues that were on the course and from the ICS today. So it's nice to have a catch up. Um, it's um, for me, I think I mean, it came along at exactly the right time. Um, that's a very obviously a personal, personal thing. I was having some some sort of pretty big challenges of, of professional confidence, perhaps at the time. And, and actually, it was it was lovely. Um, Firstly, delighted that that Leap Two is is going ahead. I think it's it's a terrifically valuable course, um, and and sort of having Sandy's introduction to to what Leap Two is going to look like, it looks like you've you've smashed it, guys. Because actually, um, all of the sessions that were that were documented there, I found extreme personal and professional benefit in in attending all of them and i probably speak on behalf of everyone when uh, if, if i would say that, that at the end of every single session we sort of didn't want them to stop because actually the the, the benefit and and the learning was was it was it was absolutely perfect um it, it sort of pitched at exactly the right level um and and it there was there was learning and and great opportunities for for personal reflection at, at every step of the way um that's not only the the sort of the taught sessions i think um that the the 360 was was a good opportunity perhaps perhaps quite a frightening opportunity to lay yourself bare but but actually the way that you you respond to that really really does define sort of who you are and how what you become i think that's there's, there's great learning as, as long as you frame it correctly great learning to be had from it um the, the one to ones have been have been very very useful um again in in the way that 
you sort of overcome some of those challenges and then you sort of do it on a on a very individual basis so so there's been there's been great opportunities um the other i think really significant point is uh that there was no requirement for any of us to level up because we were we all have a sort of shared purpose and and uh clinical focus um so never at any point was there a need to explain what we do and, and why what we do is different to everybody else um so our our, our baseline was was pretty well shared um so so huge huge benefit there in in sort of time efficiency almost i guess because we all met up we all knew what what we needed to to sort of achieve where we had specific tasks and 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 there were perhaps specific tasks within sessions there's no no need for us to explain why what we do is different to everybody else so um specific uh kudos to the to the ics elite program in that regard um i think that's probably probably all i've got for now i'll probably think of something else that's wonderful thank you david that's really really such a lovely summary um and all i i would just want to sort of add to your point of it does feel like we're not running a webinar we're having a conversation amongst friends and actually a few people are watching us actually i've kind of forgotten that there's people out there in the background emma you briefly raised your hand and then it went was yeah oh oh <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, slipping on the mouse. Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, I think what David said about the 360 actually is a real, it's something that I think if you go to your local, no disrespect, but if you go to your local leadership course or, or you take a generic course or whatever, I think it's really invaluable to put yourself in the setting that you're in with the right people. Um, it's so specific intensive care it's so niche and um, it, it just doesn't look or feel like anywhere else when you work it which is why we all love it it's what it's why we why we all put ourselves through this day in day out to be there um, and to have that ability to reflect on things and to, to get the analysis of the 360 with people who really get what you do um, makes it so much different um, when you're a trainee, you, you get offered to go on to leadership X course, leadership Y course, very brief half day thing, something like that. And you think, oh, another leadership course, whatever. But when I saw this advertised and I saw everything that was going to be put out there, it just spoke to me about being just so much more specific and directed towards us. And it's a need that we have as a, as a specialty. As we evolve as a specialty, we are becoming our own. We're no longer a hang up or, or a side gig to anything else. Intensive care is here and it's a core specialty within the hospital. And we need to, uh, to push our leaders forward to get involved and, and, and stake our claim on, on what we need and how we can be supported. And this course just gives you so many tools to do that. So um, thank you so much for thinking of it, Sandy and, and whoever else came up with the idea because it is, it's gonna advance our whole specialty so much more, the more people who get an opportunity to come on it. And it has to be cross specialty and it has to be with all our colleagues from the whole MDT involved and the strength and depth from the candidates on this course just fills me with complete hope and you know inspiration as, as as sam said for the future because if people like this are going through this course and they're going to be churned out the other end and be national leaders of whatever we're in a good place and it's it's going to be better and better no matter what pandemic or not throws at us so yeah thank you thank you and matt um yeah, sorry, this is all going to sound like, you know, sort of gushing, gushing <laughs> sentimentalism. But uh, I, I think, you know, when, when I initially found out that I was going to be on the course, I suddenly said the course programme, there was, what, 12, 12 sessions, 13 sessions or something. And I suddenly thought, goodness, this number of webinars, after everything I've been through COVID, do I want to sit through another set of webinars? Uh, and, you know, it it was really, really great how um, they were actually interactive conversations. And I think, you know, it's one of the few times uh, where actually uh, meeting online has actually felt like meeting and being able to, you know, have proper conversations and really get down to really get down to sort of some of the meat, meat of the issue. Um, and, you know, I, I think that was one of the real strengths of the course. And, I, you know, 
it's it is going to be costly the, the next time the next time around for people to apply uh, and actually doing you know having that blend of face-to-face uh, -face and online is one of the way of keeping the costs down uh, and you know sort of the you know the ambition to get people from all the corners of uh, of Britain uh, on it really will you know that this is this is an economic way of actually having them and I think you know the the faculty really managed to to make the webinars properly interactive and, and feel like it was you know you I didn't find myself doing what I normally do when I go to a webinar of sort of playing on my phone for however long we're glad to hear that thanks Matt <laughs> Oh, fabulous. I, and it does, it does feel like we're gushing a lot. But actually, I think we, we, you know, we're gushing because actually, we've all had an incredible experience together. And it was a pilot, wasn't it, Sandy? And we weren't sure how it would land. But it's isn't it so lovely to hear how it's landing? Yeah, and I agree with everyone else. It, I just thought it's so nice to see you all again and catch up and talk through matters. And yeah, it, it, it's amazing how quickly you can bond. Um, but yeah, I, I hope we, we've able to inspire others to apply. Julie, there's a question in the chat box here about uh, it's from Nicola Creamer who's asking about the Aspire to Lead webinars and, and that they appear slightly different and separate from the LEAP programme. Are they aimed at different staff groups? Do you want to talk to that? I will, I will. So Aspire to Lead is what we've called, uh, we've nicknamed Mini Leap, actually, within the society. So, so we're really aware and, and we absolutely love our Leap programme, but it is a commitment um, and it is intended for people who are slightly sort of further along that leadership journey. We, we're aware that we'll have more junior staff that are dipping their toe in the concepts of leadership. So Aspire to Lead is, is kind of a, a kind of repeated four modules, taking some of the um, ideas from the wider LEAP course. Obviously, you don't get the same level of interaction, but there are four modules that we're going to repeat twice for people who may be dipping their toe and want to learn a little bit more about leadership principles but in that ICU context so it's myself and some of uh, the others who've been working with me in the society are pulling together um, those modules so if, if if you're unsure or you're more junior in your career perhaps um, that might be the starting point for you but we would also obviously encourage people to make the leap um, did that well didn't I and join us on leap two if they can do we have any more questions we don't have any more questions coming through the Q&A so um, unless something comes up I guess we'll just uh, and any further reflections from the group, anything else to share? I might gently pick on you, Laura, <laughs> just because I'm aware we haven't given you chance to hear your voice. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I mean, I think, I mean, a lot has been said. Um, for me, I was looking like everyone else I was thrown into leadership at the start of the pandemic imposter syndrome felt like a duck out of water exactly what Alison said of sort of I was just reacting I was just winging it I was just and I really wanted some background knowledge um but I didn't yeah I, I was asking at work and I was saying I don't want to go to a university I don't want to be writing essays I'm you know I'm working more than full-time I've got a family at home I, I haven't got time but I need to back this up and this course was that exact fit um and you know I you know it was an honor to be on the course it was an honor to meet the people the the bonding experience was phenomenal of just you know you realize you're not alone it's not just your trust it's it's nationwide and you know we we created whatsapp groups there's messages still ongoing going help how am I doing this any solution you know there's little groups offset trying to set up Caesar programs and things like that because we may as well put more brains together it's just it, it's been so so good and friendships and and the help has just 
it's def it's developed me so so much um and i would encourage anyone to apply and yeah we've we've been lucky you know we didn't have to pay but i would absolutely pay and i'd pay more for it for this you know and i th I, I think you know in in a, certainly in our trust trying to get people to take up leadership roles is difficult and the the exec teams are looking for keen people and i get the impression you know if i was to go to my exec team with someone who was coming in and offer this and say look it's going to cost you three grand but look what you're going to get out of it any sensible exec team would leap at that chance wonderful thank you laura and a beautiful leap thrown in there for good measure as well fabulous oh we've just had another comment uh come through so so just uh from rick saying thanks very much really encouraging and useful to to sit and listen many leadership courses seem so distant from the reality of critical care this sounds like a perfect opportunity hopefully i'll be successful second time round. please do apply rick absolutely and others that are out there as well if you're inspired uh, by Leap One um, and our lovely panel today, please do give Leap Two uh, a think. Um, we'll certainly get the, the recording of this webinar up on the website with the application so that if anyone came through halfway through or, or missed um, any of the discussion, you can go back and reflect on that and listen again um and for for those who are unable to join because that's that's uh that's some um, typical critical care something comes up last minute and gets in the way uh they'll obviously have access to this um sandy over to you any final remarks thanks everyone um i want to just acknowledge the COVID healthcare support appeal they were the ones that um funded um seventy thousand pound towards this course and the intensive care society funded the rest i'd also like to thank our amazing leap one alumni those on the panel today but those that weren't here as well and they were here in spirit i think it's been a pleasure to work with you all over the last year and i look forward to staying friends and, and staying connected as the years go by and to watching your leadership journeys and um do please consider applying for leap two our LEAP1 alumni have volunteered to act as mentors for people on LEAP2 as well. So we'll be keeping them well connected and close to us too, and you'll have the opportunity to speak with them. So good luck everyone, and thank you very much for listening today. Thanks again to our panel and to Julie. Thanks everyone. Thanks for listening out there. Take care, bye-bye.